Hey guys, Daniel Lungu from Money Matters with Daniel. Today, I'm going to be talking about a super exciting topic that I think it that I think can relate to pretty much anybody. Anybody that is really in the process of dating or in a relationship already or even more advanced stages, marriage or before marriage. Today is all about how not letting money ruin your relationship. So stay tuned. And today I'm going to be broadcasting live, so that's why you see this laptop in front of me, to a, a group online that is signed up for today's webinar. So what you're going to be seeing is actually the recording of this webinar and you're going to see me talking about the discussion, talking about the topics. And when you see this video, comment on the video and let me know what some of the issues that you might face um, in your relationship. What do you found to be beneficial? And what some of the things that you feel like I have not covered that I should be covering next time. So again, Daniel Lungo from Manny Matters with Daniel. Stay tuned. So let's get started. Um, I know that probably some people, additional people will trickle in. Um, I hope that with the time of the day, I know that we originally were scheduled for yesterday, but a lot of the time uh, people are in the weekend, you know how busy they get and uh, you know how um, hectic it can be. So uh, they tried, a lot of people wrote to me and asked me, can you move it to Monday? So I'm sure there will be some people trickle in, whether it's to call uh, through the phone or dial through the computer. And uh, so if I stop for a second, just know that because somebody new has hopped on the call and I will just ask them to introduce themselves briefly. But uh, without further ado, um, if all of you guys can hear me pretty well and I just need to, your confirmation, then uh, let's get uh, right, uh, right into the gist and the meat and bones of today's conversation. Okay. We are good to start. <laughs> All right. Amy, you hear me well? We can get start? Yeah, no problem. All right, fantastic. So uh, let's get started a little bit. I'm sure you're probably curious who the hell is this guy and why does he decide to talk about you know money and especially money and relationships. So a little bit background about myself. Uh, my name is Daniel Lungu. I am uh, the owner of Apex Capital Group, which is a wealth management firm. Um, obviously, we are independent and I want to make sure that it's cl very clear from the get-go. This call, this conversation, this topic is not here to solicitate new clients. It's literally merely me um, out of the many, many years of working with different clients, different families, different couples, um, different financial topics that I found to be useful and I just want to share it, the knowledge with the rest of the world. So this is what today's call is all about. Um, you know. What I found to be, and just kind of general statistics, and that's something that I found from the internet, and of course, you know that in the in California, and especially in the U.S., statistics may vary, but almost 50% of couples uh, that are in that married couples end up divorcing. And uh, some statistics really report that 7 out of 10 couples really... Uh, find that identify the reason for their separation, the reason for their failure, whether it's a relationship or marriage, is predominantly due to finance issues. And uh, I'm sure that you guys can relate to some degree uh, that money is a very important factor between a couple. And if you guys don't see eye to eye on that topic, it can be extremely challenging to move forward. And even in the initial stages when you don't get to see that because you all butterfly and you have what they call, you know, the, the goggles, the, the relationship look pretty uh, and uh, there's no, uh, no issues. But as they get serious, money tend to be a big factor. So I'm sure you guys can relate and I see that you're nodding with your head. So I know that uh, it, it is definitely. Amy, could you agree on that, uh, on that uh, kind of general idea? Yeah, well, that's why I'm on the call. I'm 
you know, engaged and we just moved in together and, you know, this is, this is where we're at. So. Okay, great. And we're looking for to your insight. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So uh, let me kind of kind of start the conversation today, and I have some kind of of course stopping uh, talking points um, that I want to cover. So I'm gonna really today break it down to we're gonna talk a little bit about obviously what some of the issues that we foresee, uh, and, and for me from experience about having money being uh, the predominantly issue within relationships. So some of the things that are early signs that you can sense that money is a factor, money is an issue and some of the things that you need to kind of be aware of. And then I will further segment that into pre, uh, pre-relationship or pre-marriage, like Amy, you are engaged, so congratulations, by the way. But um, I think this is a very sensitive time, and I think some of the top uh, talking points that I will have today are really be relatable exactly for that point. And then I will jump into what some action plans that you can take if you are already in, uh, in let's say, marriage or engagement, well, where you know you a little bit have that stronger tie than just uh, being in as early stages of your relationship. Okay, guys. Amy. Yeah, absolutely. All right, fantastic. Um, so let's get started with the first thing, which I think is very trivial. So a little bit of kind of like preliminary signs about where money can be an issue. And that's really across the board. And I would start with just early stages of the relationship where um, people getting started, it's dating period. Again, it's, I call it like the honeymoon phase. Um, a lot of the times, the one of the most fundamental thing that people can see is that there's no really discussion between the couple about any uh, money related topics. And uh, whether, you know, when we are when we are talking about money, we have to remember that we are very, very different. And that very different goes to the root of like our family, our upbringing, then the fact also in addition about whether we are a female or a male. And not having the ability to understand that from the get-go, it can be extremely detrimental to our future relationship. So let's kind of dive into the specifics of what is that that I mean about those early signs. So for example, when we talk about money, I think it's very important to many times, if you are in the dating stage, to really just bring it up as a topic. Just, you know what, tell me a little bit about how do you foresee money? How money is, uh, what is your perception about money? About spending habits, about uh, what do you do with that, with your hard earned money? And uh, just judging by the answer of the person, you can tell a lot about whether they are a saver, they are a spender, and what is some of the core value that is important to them. You can really follow up with a, with a question after they share with you a little bit about what is value to them, and you can just say, what, you know, if you had a spare, spare dime or if you saved up a little bit, what would you rather spend on? Again, having that, um, that mentality that you are matching in philosophy. So if you are a saver in nature and that only you can tell about yourself, it will be extremely difficult to be with somebody who is a natural spender. And having that open discussion can be a very, um, very helpful because depending on what type of person uh, he or she is, you're able to approach the situation very differently. And I think that is really the fundamental aspect. And when we are talking also about, in addition to that, whether we, we are a female or a male, you have to remember that, and that's a little bit of a generalization, but from experience as a financial planner, and Amy, please chime in to this uh, as you being the female uh, on, uh, on the call over here. I found that females to be a little bit more, um, more concerned with their money, with security, they're more careful. They're generally also good savers uh, if they want to. Of course, there's also spenders, but they're definitely not a risk takers with their money. They will not be the ones that will be more aggressive on investments and things like that. And that's really the nature of, of females. They wanna make sure that they have their emergency, their basis covered first before doing anything else while male are being a little bit more aggressive about their their money 
many time impulsive and tend to also have more um, more spending habits than what I would say females do on a particular cases. Um, Amy, would you like to tell me a little bit what do you feel about uh, this kind of like generalization that I have uh, I have shared with you right now? Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I actually thought you were gonna present it the opposite. I thought you were gonna say women were normally the spenders, but in my relationship, I am the saver, and my fiance is definitely the spender. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, and sorry, I didn't get your name. What is your name again, sir? Ravik. Ravik. Yeah. Ravik, what do you feel about this uh, this kind of generalization and experience? And I think I think you always have to remember that it goes down to kind of like I like to call it biologically. If we're going back, you have to remember that uh, females are a lot of the times are there to care for their household, for their kids, if there are kids. Um, so there is that sense of like protection. You always want to first protect, and then maybe you think about other things. While you know, male a lot of the times are more impulsive you know they, they we are thinking with an impulse and we rational uh, rational it with uh, with kind of like we make emotional decisions and we rational it with logic so male are very logical thinkers but with the deep inside they are first making decision emotional let's say for example we want something and a lot of the time will men go ahead and buy it and then we'll rational it that we will need it Females will first will make sure that they, and that's again, that's a generalization, doesn't apply to everyone, but gen, females first will make sure that they care for all their uh, basic necessities. That's why when it comes to working with female clients of mine and working with them on the budget, which is something we're going to talk today about, I find that a lot of females are better about maintaining uh, a budget, maintaining about understanding of their cash flow, where male, it's a lot of the time, is like they know they can just you know, spend it and don't have as a good grip of their finances. Um, so I think that's really, if once understanding the foundation of the differences that we have, I want to take it another step further about also when you have that discussion, an open discussion about money, and that's in the early stages of the relationship, don't be afraid to ask also about, well, tell me a little bit about your parents. Tell me a little bit about who in your family is maybe the main breadwinner or who, which one of your parents is a saver or a spender. You know, there's the saying, apples doesn't fall far away from the tree. And you might be able to identify by judging uh, and hearing about the parents what the person in front of you, your spouse, your significant other, your potential mate, who are they most likely like. Are they like their mom or like their dad? If one of them is more a spender, you are able to identify who are they with. And especially things like asking, who do you normally talk about finances? Do you talk about uh, when it comes to your parents? Are you talking more with your father or are you talking more with your mother? And by identifying who is who, you're able to also kind of generally understand what is the person in front of you is like. Are they a spender or are they a saver? So that's the second thing that I always recommend doing and, uh, and I think that is a huge help of just an early signs of understanding who the person is and that will give you the foundation of knowing how to approach things um, in particular when it comes to getting started on your relationship. I want to move forward a little bit that now what happens if you are already in relationship? What some of the things that I noticed uh, over the years and experience that I've been a key identifying to potential problems. And the first thing that I want to start with is an obvious one, is when the two are have a significant gap of earnings. So if you, for example, you obviously might know the specific figure, 
but you might know judging by the position of the individual approximately if they're making good income or not in comparison to what you and I think you can be honest with yourself of understanding where the gap is and if there is the gap and many times because of that gap and doesn't apply always if you are you know equal earners then that's a little bit different but a lot of the time there is a gap and the gap comes with inherited assumption and those inherited assumption mean that usually the person with the larger income tend to assume financial decision within the relationship they feel like because they're making more money they have the say in the relationship and that is a big no-no you definitely want to make sure to again and having that discussion about the relationship understand that even though one is making more money it doesn't mean that they have the say it needs to be especially in relationship it needs to be and I am I'm leaning a little bit towards the marriage side but it needs to be kind of like an equal say you need to discuss things openly with one another and before you do that uh, you always need to have the right foundation in place and that's I think one something that uh, before we go to the foundation and the steps and what some of the things that um, are more concrete I want to hear from you guys again I'm very want to make sure that it's involving do you feel like you have between your relationship or past relationship that because of a, a potential gap of income there was that uh, assumption of uh, financial making decision where one thought that oh I'm making more money it's my say versus your say Amy yeah um, I, for me it's not the gap of earning that's our major issue um, he does make you know substantially more than me but you know part of the issue is he's divorced and so there's a lot of prior obligations so uh -huh. with that you know if we evened it out you know I think we're we're very close or I actually probably make more um, mm -hmm. you know I think it's relating more to our difference in ideology of you know kind of what you talk about this spending versus saving and trying to understand and respect our differences and figure out a way to, to compromise it yeah and I think uh, I think it's really a key, like you're saying. It's it's about opening the cards, being transparent with one another, being open with one another about um, kind of what are the money habits, what is the, our mentality. Because remember, we are both individuals that are coming with um, with background thoughts, habits that comes with money, and a lot of the time, those habits has been with us from childhood. If we came, and I know, for example, I will give you an example about myself. I brought up with a very conservative fiscal family, which it was always about save, 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 save. And uh, if I'm with somebody who naturally was not like that, was never explained what is a budget, living under your means, and understanding kind of like what is a cash flow, that would be extremely difficult. I hope you guys understand that. So having, again, then that's maybe the over um, the umbrella of sharing with each other, going back to discussion and talking with each other openly, tell me a little bit about your money habits. You know, are you, what do you do when you get paid? Do you put a certain percentage away? Do you try to save? Um, are you investing your money? If so, you know, what some of your current financial goals that you are trying to accomplish? You have a little bit of better understanding when you ask the specific questions. And I think it's it needs to be um, in a lay down, not like, like you penetrating their privacy, but rather like, hey, you know, I like you. I see a potential and a future with you. And I want to make sure that we are compatible on some of these topics. I want to know what some of the things that you value to be the most important for you and I want to make sure that you understand what is the most important for me. Because if a person, when I ask about savings, for example, if you ask me, what would you do with some of your savings? I would go about saying, okay, I will put some money first into ensuring that I have enough in emergency and that obviously all my bills are covered and all everything like that. And then the rest, excessive amount, I will invest. 
So that will be my answer. And if the other person will be able to say, well, I will uh, first go and uh, get myself new pairs of shoes or clothing, and you have a better understanding of priorities. Some people have different priorities when it comes to their money, and that is totally okay. You need to be understanding that that is how uh, some people work. And uh, by laying out the priorities that you have, that also can be very easy to detect future problems. And uh, by just having that open discussion, you're able to um, maybe lay out the ground. You know, if you communicate with one another and you share with each other, hey, this is some of my goals. Here's some of the things that I want to do. You might inspire the other person or you might open their eyes about some of the things that they might have not been aware of completely, not because of their fault, but rather because maybe nobody talked to them about that, which we found that 72% of Americans are not even living their life uh, with a budget or living their life with understanding how much goes in versus how much goes out. And I would actually would like to turn the question to you. Do you have a clear understanding of that kind of relationship? What comes in versus what goes out? So I think as we progress closer towards a uh, kind of action plan and you know, what some of the things that I would recommend to any new couple or even a married couple, I will find you will find a lot of those things to be extremely beneficial. Amy, uh, same question to you. Do you feel like um, some of that kind of expectation and understanding of the uh, kind of ground? Do you have a good understanding of what comes in versus what goes out? What some of your clear current financial goals? Yeah, so I use a program called Mint.com. So it's a great one. I'm, you know, on the side of, you know, up to the second, I can tell you exactly what my net worth is. I can tell you how much I've spent on every category, you know, for my finance. So I've been very meticulous in that. Um, my fiancé, however, you know, I introduced him to Mint, and mm -hmm. he liked the idea of it, and it was extraordinarily eye-opening to him. He had no idea income and outcome. He thought he was fine. He was doing these things on an Excel spreadsheet. He would create budgets, but he didn't understand that in order for a budget to work, you have to, um, you know, you have to go back and look at, okay, I created this great plan. Did I follow it, and was I over under um, you know, so he was extraordinarily over, um, you know, so that, that was an eye-opening thing. Um, and I think that's, you know, later on I do have a question for you about that. But, you know, for anyone that is not familiar with men and you're interested in doing budgeting, for me personally, it's been very helpful. I don't know if you would agree, but... Um, generally, Mint is a great platform. is is definitely a great platform for um, I want to say on a on a kind of basic level. Um, as you start getting into more intricate items, um, I think uh, Mint is a little bit starting to lack. But to get started, it's it's the shiny, it's the colorful, it's the graphs, the pie, the charts. It makes it uh, you know interactive. It gives you advice. And I agree with you, Mint.com is a great starting point. I know uh, some people use also Quicken uh, to kind of track their expenses, whether depending on your job, if you're self-employed or if you are W-2 employee, um, it's definitely, definitely a good, a good starting point. So there's definitely great programs out there, but the fact that you already are on top of that says so much more about you um, in terms of what some of your money habits. And I think you see that we always coming back to this money habits and uh, understanding what some of the things that are important to you and how you operate. You have to always remember that the way you operate is not the way somebody else operates. It's just kind of um, kind of how people are. So let's keep going. I, I'm, I'm loving this. I'm loving the open discussion. I'm loving the, the feedback that each one of you is giving. And I hope so far you've been getting some basic uh, understanding and I want to I don't want to keep this conversation way too long and stretch it out and we can talk for hours because this is a topic I'm so passionate about 
but I want to give you also like practical things because I hate the type of webinars when you are kind of like dialing in or you connecting and you really hope to get the meat and bones and uh, and that's really what I want to give you. I want you to walk out of here with some practical things and already some things are giving you that are about kind of open discussion and uh, and talking points that I think are important but I there's a lot more and I want to share with that with you. So we talked so far kind of a quick recap. We talked a little bit about being transparent, being open, having the opportunity to share with one another and it's very important that when you do that is that you do it in a neutral territory. So it is extremely, extremely important and I really want to make sure that you know that. You don't do that at home. You don't do it either if you are in that stage of dating, early stages of the relationship, whether I mean, in your case you're engaged, so I don't know if you already live together, you move together or each one of you still keep your own separate place. You do not do it in one of your locations. You want to do it in a neutral place where you are able to go and uh, and discuss it without having the feeling that one of you is trying to pull the blanket to your side. And I think that is extremely, extremely important because then you can feel both feel vulnerable. You can feel like you are able to open up. Now, another place that I would definitely recommend to use as if you don't use and that is should be also part of the discussion is that when you talk about finance you also want to ask the person besides their financial goals what some of their expectations uh, should we get together so for example setting right expectation and matching expectation is a key so Amy you're about to get married and I'm again congratulations but if your expectation is once you to get married to immediately buy a house and your spouse is far away from that position because in his mind his dream was always to get married and take his beautiful wife on a six month trip honeymoon around the world you have a mismatch of expectation would you agree with me yeah absolutely so having that expectation set and understanding what some of your current financial goals so as you share with one another what is something that you do right now it's also expressing to one another what some of your future financial goals what are you trying to accomplish tell me a little bit about your goals within the next three five years what's some of the first thing that on the immediate uh, short-term goals and in the financial world even goals up to 20 years are considered short-term goals unless you like 20 minutes 20 years from retirement if you're in the earlier stages of your life 20 years uh, can be still considered short-term goals and there are certain things that you can uh, you can do that um, apologies that you can do that able to kind of build it. I call it the financial blueprint, and I will share with you an attachment uh, in my email that will be following up this conversation. It's just a schematic way of taking a look at your finances, taking a look at do you have any holes in your financial structure, and you can actually bring that kind of blueprint, as I call it financial blueprint and share it with your partner saying like hey I have this but I don't have that and you can see it there's there's the foundation there is a short-term goal there's long-term goals and then there is like that arc of protection what do you do to in order to protect your assets and I think this is a very interactive non-hostile way of kind of engaging one another and sharing with one another what is that that we have what is that that we're trying to accomplish in the short term and long term. So I think that is really a key. All right, so so far we've been talking about the kind of the preliminary, some signs, what we have seen that can give us an indication that there might be um, challenges or problems. I do want to add one more key to that, which is a lot of the times, and Amy kind of talked about that, is one of the couple is just more savvy with money and or more savvy you know in general there are the people that are more like carefree they don't necessarily care about their finances they don't follow a budget and there are somebody like you Amy that you know you're pretty meticulous you check your bank accounts on maybe on a daily basis um, you have a mint that you follow you have investment accounts that you follow you maybe even have a financial advisor that you consult regularly that you meet with him once or her once a quarter or once every six months 
and uh, you are able to really stay on top of your uh, on top of your finances. So when you have that open discussion about expectations, about your current financial situation, don't try to outsmart the other person and show that you are better off than the other person because they don't do it. It's it's just important to accept the fact that people are different and uh, no matter what is that that they tell you how they handle their finance, it should not be coming as a judgmental uh, or how come you have not done this or how come you don't do that. No, you just be, need to be very listening, very open and just truly understand one another that Again, we are different, and that is okay. So far, any questions? So, so far we are talking, it looks like we are talking about steady income, you know, you know, uh, steady definite uh, salary. Yeah, you really explaining it's easier in this case. Yeah, you know, that, that income, that's it. You know, that this income, and you have the, this are uh, which goes out. You can plan it very easily. But there are lots of professions which are commission based. So Correct. So you may think, oh, yeah, maybe this month we won't have anything. Next month you will have like a million. And it's kind of up and down, and you can't uh, predict and plan. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I understand still there is some average uh, when it will come to an end of the year, but still you don't know what will be. So in this case, in these professions, it's not that difficult. Yeah. I, I think I think the the question is that, and I will repeat it in case some people didn't hear. Um, I think the question is, what do you do when the income source and the frequency of your income is maybe a little bit inconsistent, and especially with the amount due to having jobs that are more maybe commission based? Um, how is that impact? So that is a specific that I will cover when the, we talk about the topic of uh, really kind of budgeting, how to approach budgeting with a, with, uh, with a spouse or with a partner. And in that segment, I will explain to you how do you approach uh, when you have an inconsistent income. But just to give you a little bite size of information, generally speaking, when you talk about this or if you live together and you sit together to have a budget, you have a general understanding and the good uh, the good way to look at it is you can just take a look at the last year and you can see unless your this current year has drastically changed um, and in that case I would probably recommend to take the last three months but you want to take a look at kind of identify an average you want to identify an average that you think coming in you still have to remember you have some basic needs that need to be covered and you need to understand what is the way that you think that you can pull on uh, on that on on I guess on your shoulder on your weight. And with that being said, that's also in addition to that. Besides, of course, having a concrete understanding of a budget, the key element to that is also having the right emergency. The right emergency fund will be able to by far to uh, to I guess pad the months that you are maybe not doing so well and there is a methodology and logic behind the madness of how much exactly money should I have in emergency and whether I am a salary base or whether I am um, you know a commission based and that will be able to not only stabilize your monthly expenses your bills your lifestyle but also stabilize your relationship in turn okay so we're going to touch about it in a second, okay? I promise. Amy, do you have any question? Um, no, I like what you're saying. I mean, I think you're right on, you know, not trying to outsmart the other. I wish I talked to you, you know, a week ago <laughs> because I was trying to help him, you know, set up his mint and it just wasn't going well. And, you know, I guess with that, you know, a question that, you know, feel free to answer down the road, but do you think it's better for someone else to help him instead of me? Because he's, he's very willing to do it, but, um, you know, do you think it can cause problems? I'm the one trying to manage his budget. Yeah, so I think it's a great question. I think, uh, you know, the, I will repeat again the question uh, for both the camera and the, for the recording, is that should you should you really, like, impose your help or try to help to your partner 
uh, or should we actually seek like a third person, whether it's a financial planner uh, or somebody else that uh, is more in a neutral position that can help? The answer, there's no right or wrong answer because again, according to what you're telling me, your significant other seems to be very open about seeking help. The thing is, it's about also how you deliver the help. Again, remember that even that you help, it's you want and you, and I, that's taking it to a little bit more of a of a like pure relationship style. You have to remember that men are very ego driven. We don't want to feel. Uh, and I'm talking about, you know, just a lot of men that I come across. You don't want to feel like we don't have a grip on something, even if we don't know it 100%. It is extremely difficult for men to admit, you know what, I simply don't know how to do it. I need help. And we have a little bit, whether we want it or not, that little like protection uh, uh, around us where we feel a little bit resistant, where we found that something is trying to be imposed on us. So you truly have to be the gauge to understand how much to kind of like inform the person, how much you want to include into uh, the process. And you have to remember that right now you're trying to include him and change him to be on the same wavelength as you are, which you are on mint when you are on, you know, on a specific way of doing things. But maybe even if he goes halfway, this is already an accomplishment. And remember that some things are not done overnight. Rome was not built overnight, as they say. So sometimes you just have to have a progression, which leads me, leads me to the practical approach. So I think you guys both starting to seek some practical answers. And so let's kind of dive right through it. So if you're already in relationship, you are in marriage, What's some of the things that you can do in order to get started on a, on a, you know, on a clean slate? And if you already have differences of finance, what is that that you can do? So the first thing I call it the financial date. A financial date is something that you combine, obviously, the romance, the fun, and, and the ability also to, as I said, include a non-hostile -host environment to discuss very important topics to your relationship. And I think it's important to have it as almost as a habit. The way you think that you need to invest into your relationship, whether it's to go on a date, take a, you know, a getaway sometime, it is very important that you regularly do of what I call a financial date. In the initial stages of the financial date, whether you are in relationship or whether you are in marriage, you have to remember that, again, people are coming with different views, different backgrounds, and you want to, whoever is in initiating this kind of discussion needs to understand that you have to ease your way into this. Because if you come blasting with about, oh, we should like save and we should budget and we should do this, it can be very um, shocking to a person who never done it. So having that earlier discussion that even if you are more in the advanced stages of your relationship, I think it's important to just start talking about it, starting to have that neutral territory where you can talk about it. Hey, listen, I wanted to talk to you about something that I think is extremely important to the success of our relationship. I have found it to be extremely important for me and the way I handle my life. And I want to share it with you. And I want to hear your opinion about the matter. And then you can tell a little bit about who you are as a person. How do you uh, approach finance? How do you approach your financial decision making? And you will be amazed about what you hear from the other person. They might find it to be fascinating. They might find it the topic that you talk about something that never was discussed with them. And they will be very open to learning more. So that is step number one. Step number two is once you have already established a little bit kind of like on a regular, uh, regular basis, when you feel comfortable talking with each other about finances, you want to have the first real financial kind of share where you share with one another in more detail. And I call it just open your cards, you know, and that's where you share with each other that after you build a little bit level of comfort, you share with each other what are some of your current plan. Now, I'm, I'm talking a little bit about dating couple, engaged couple like you, 
But if you're in a married couple, and let's say you have one spouse that is the main breadwinner and the person that is also more financial savvy and does the majority of the financial decision, maybe it is important that you share with your spouse what some of the what some of the things that have been going on. Like, hey, here's what some of the things that we've been doing. Here's how our accounts look like. Here's some of the current financial goals that I have in mind. What do you think about some of those financial goals? Do you agree with me? Do you think that we should allocate each month this amount of money towards this goal? And that's how you slowly bring out the topic of budgeting. If one of the other spouse have no clue or understanding about the topic of budgeting, this is really how you want to bring it up. And once you bring it up and once you share with one another, what is that that you've been doing? The financial decisions that you've been making thus far as individual, because a lot of like Amy, I'm sure that you and your fiance, you still have separate bank accounts. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Now, and at this point, I think we may forever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, I do want you to know uh, that a lot of the times people do rush into jumping and commingling your assets. And that is not necessarily something that I would recommend. Again, depending on how different people are, you want to maybe ease it in for first understanding that you're on the same uh, playing field in order to get into like a commingling uh, of assets. So in the beginning, it's okay to have separate accounts, but I do think that the budget should be shared because then it's a lot of the time it is an eye opening. You have the ability to show the other person, here's what is our total expenses. Here's how much total comes in between your income, my income. Here is what is our other type of expenses throughout the month whether it's you know how much we spend on food, how much we spend on this. And once you have that, like it's almost like a bonding um, exercise that you can do together. And again, it should be not hostile. You should not by all means say, I can't believe you spend that much money on, uh, you know, on a gym membership that you're paying $250 on Equinox. You, sh you should not say that, okay? Even if you think that, you should just bring it up. I might have already said that. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, that kind of how you would go about it. You put it in a visual way. Remember that people learn yeah. differently. Some are auditory listeners. They learn by listening. Some are visual. They need to see it. And by having a budget written down together, you can have each one of you a separate sheet, and then you compare it. You can exchange it. Uh, you can give yourself almost like a task. Hey, um, how about we schedule a financial date for uh, next week you know, on Tuesday where we meet and uh, we share a bottle of wine and our assignment for, the, for our financial date is kind of filling out our own budget and uh, kind of share it with one another. It's extremely important for me to understand what comes in versus what goes out and I would like to know what goes in, what goes out in your case, in your uh, scenario. So having that in yeah. place is extremely helpful. Yeah, no, that's a great idea. Is that something you would suggest to do ongoing? Is this like a weekly date and maybe for a specified amount of time so it doesn't get <laughs> well, out of control? Initially, initially, when you get started, you want to do it maybe on a, a once a week basis when you get together and you just kind of enjoy it. But as time progress and you know you kind of get it in a routine, it's very hard because you know life is hectic. You, it's very hard to maintain on a once a week basis. But at least once a month, you want to sit down together, and as a married couple or as an engaged couple, especially if you live together, a lot of the times you have the bills that's coming out, you have the rent or mortgage. If you, again, if you're married and you bought a house or not, or if you're renting, you have maybe other expenses. It is important that you bring it all up and you share with one another, well, this is what's been going on and uh, I want you to be aware of that. And this is also the time to be aware of some unforeseen expenses that has occurred throughout the month. Obviously, our month is not linear, it's not stagnant as much as we want. You can drive in a freeway and all of a sudden you, you know, you hit up... Uh, a hole in the road and you destroy the uh, the rim of the, the of the car including the wheel 
uh, excuse me, the, the tire. So now you have to buy a whole new rim and a brand new tire, and that is was unforeseen expense, and the, which now it has to come out of somewhere, and it's important to share it with your spouse or significant other. So having that open, I'm um, talking discussion, is very helpful on an ongoing basis. Wait, you saying you saying if you discuss those things, you might have more disagreements? Yeah, they often you do that, and uh, the more is probability that you have more disagreements. I guess. So. I honestly think that it's about the delivery. Delivery over here is a key. It's important to make sure that during the discussion of these topics, that you maintain it in a very kind of like not a pointing finger. You do not want to come to a pointing finger and say like, I can't believe that you did this. Which I guess leads me to another point, whether uh, you are in relationship or like marriage, is about you want to set up maybe, I call it a spending... Uh, a spending rule where you tell each other we are comfortable spending this X amount of money without the the discussion or sharing with the other person so for example Vic if you want to go and you want to have your favorite you know once a week your favorite restaurant and have a lunch in that restaurant and that lunch is a $50 lunch, okay? Let's say you're going to Brazilian barbecue. This is amount that you should not say, oh, I need to call my, uh, my wife or my, uh, my fiance to approve that, okay? But if you want to buy a new barbecue for the house and that barbecue costs, let's say, $500, well, that's something that maybe you want to discuss it. So you set up a, like a roof, a limit, where you tell one another, listen, any purchases or expenses that go beyond this amount, we would share with one another. Okay? This way, sorry? That's what happens in companies as well. Yeah. In where? In, in regular companies, when there is a certain amount of uh, money to be spent, the CEO himself can't make a decision if it's a big deal. Um, all members or investors should uh, must agree. Yes, yes, I, I definitely agree with you. And I think having that, it, it goes beyond just maintaining a healthy finance and healthy relationship, but it also shows a level of, um, of unity. You share with one another, you participate, you involve the other person in the financial making decision, which in turn brings you closer together. You come to the decision making together and all of a sudden you realize that a problem that could have arise from you making the purchase, let's say Vicky went and you bought this, you know, this new barbecue that is $500 and because you really wanted it and then you come home with a barbecue and your significant other, you know, your wife or your uh, fiance or girlfriend tells you, why in the world did you buy a barbecue when we have to, you know, spend this amount of money on something else that she might have thought in her mind and she not shared it with you? But by you telling her, hey, you know, honey, I'm thinking about getting this barbecue. What do you think? She might be able to then express to you, hey, I just want to remind you that A, we set up this goal or B, this what have happened this, this past month and we have to cover that or we have to take care of that first and it takes precedence on our kind of like cash flow uh, or mo monthly cash flow. So I think that is extremely important is having that rule. It can be a hundred dollars limit, it can be two hundred dollar limit. You guys can set it yourself and uh, it really goes down back again to the budget. Why is it so important to set that budget from the first place? Because once you see how much comes in versus how much goes out, you're able to determine are you above water or are you under the water and then do we have to offset with one another whether it's like the spouse's income is basically balancing the loss that I have because I'm not bringing enough or vice versa. Does that, does that make sense? This is a good way uh, to avoid blaming each other. Absolutely, absolutely. There's, there's more openness and there's more, again, there's no unexpected uh, 
like there there will not be any more of that you never told me or you never shared with me or I didn't know that that is what's going on or that is something that I should be aware of which is all the time that happens on a daily basis Amy do you feel the same way yeah absolutely no I think that's a great idea you know I have been one-sided you know I I have not fully shared with Mark you know, he's never looked at my mix. here I am dissecting his you know, he knows how much money I make. We know how we split our rent every month. But, you know, I've never fully showed him everything, really. So I think that's, you know, you got to be on equal footing. And I think creating that together is, is a really great idea. Okay. So now that we have basically established uh, an open form, an open platform, where we feel comfortable sharing with one another and discussing financial decision, we have set up a limit a little bit where we feel that we should involve our spouse and we should involve our significant other about how much is that that we need to you know, spend and how much we feel comfortable about spending. Another thing that we should discuss with one another is the understanding of the, ra the right foundation needs. And what do I say and, and what do I mean by that? Because each one of us have separate income and many times we still maintain separate accounts and we just share maybe bills. We still are responsible for our own foundation and emergency needs. We should never, never assume that because, you know, I'm in a financial pickle. Let's say I was laid off and I need to sustain my share of the income, my share of the bills. You know, Amy, like in your case where you guys share the bills. You never want to assume that the other, that your spouse will cover your share because he or she have maybe making either more income or they were smart enough about having a set aside for emergency. It is extremely important that you each have your own foundation, your own padding and your own amount that you set aside in case of a rainy day. And going back again, and I promised you, Vic, that I will touch base on that. Here we go. So the rule of thumb that as a financial planner we tell to each one of our clients is that, that you want to have three to six months worth of your total monthly expenses. So if you take a look and when you create that budget and you share that budget with one another, you want to know what is basically your share of your monthly expenses. Okay? And you want to understand what is that that you need to bring. Now, if you're already in a married situation, you commingle the accounts, you understand what is that the coming in versus what goes out, and you made sure that your spouse and significant other understand that, well, now you have to understand that you, have an, you need to have enough sitting aside to ensure that in case of a rainy day happens, you do not starting to have the heat between both of you, that you are basically turning to one another saying, you know, we're good. We have that emergency that is we set up aside and we know that it's enough to keep us afloat. And then there's no that feeling of like if one spouse is working, that they have that feeling, that burden that, God damn it, I have to carry the entire relationship right now on my shoulders. And that creates tension and heat. Not even if initially is being brought up, but later with time, if that's not something that is kind of like channeled um, and open discussed about it, which a lot of the times, you know, the spouse or significant other will never admit that feeling because a lot of the time it's not the fault of the spouse if they were laid off or something happened. So you still want to be supportive, but that internally, you, you can admit to yourself that you would feel that, uh, wouldn't you, like Amy, Vic, wouldn't you feel that if your significant other is right now out of work and cannot bring their share to the table, wouldn't you feel like, now the burden fell on your shoulders. Well, it's, you're, you're like explaining that life. I was actually the one laid off December 31st, and I've been without a job. I'm starting a new job in a week. So congratulations. You're exactly right. Three months. You need three months. I didn't have to three months. Um, and and I want to reiterate of because you don't just like say okay three to six months. If you there there's again there's a a, a, a method behind the madness. If you are um, a salary based where you have a steady salary, you want to have closer to the three months set aside. 
okay? Now, granted, you don't need to have all of them just sitting in the bank. You can have one month sitting in the bank and the other two like in a liquid investment account. That's okay because even if it's in a liquid investment account, you can still pull, pull the money out and have it in your account within three business days. So I'm not saying you need to have a large uh, chunk of money sitting around. Vic, in, yeah. in your case, um, I think it's, it's important to remember because you mentioned about commission-based. You want to have closer to the six months worth of expenses. Now, how do you do that? If you have a great month and you know that you brought a lot more money, think ahead about the months that maybe you will not have that much money and you definitely want to start setting more money aside uh, and remembering that it's, in your case, it's like waves and you want to be prepared for in case there's months that you're not able to provide as much uh, like, you, uh, like you've done in previous months. Does that make sense, Vic? Yeah, that's, uh, that's good for up and down situation. Yeah. So again, that having that cushion will definitely help level out that feeling of burden and, and uh, avoiding that tension of uh, that, you know, something is, is happening, the burden falls on one of the couple, and you, you just feel like you, you can't really uh, do that. Now, part of, again, we're kind of circling around the same, the same realm, but once you have that open discussion about the budget, about income, how much goes in versus how much goes out, you're able to see a lot of the times also if the person that you are about to either get into a serious long-term relationship like, you know, uh, Amy with, the, with engagement, or if you're in marriage, you're able to understand are, the, are there any debt that's coming in that now are going to become partially my responsibility? Um, because you have to remember that if the person has a credit card debt or, let's say, massive student loans, then those are things that you have to take in consideration. Now it becomes part of your responsibility uh, once they are coming into the commingle relationship because that individual, whether it's you or your significant other, still has to carry for those burdens, whether it's credit card debt, and if you're in marriage, the default or bad credit um, habits of one spouse definitely impact the credit of the other spouse. So that is a key. It's a key to remember that and to be upfront and open about it. And then if you do have that issue, and I will create an entire topic of discussion about how to pay off debt faster, how to eliminate your student debt, uh, your federal student debt, if that applies to some of you. <coughs> but that's important that you have an action plan in place. A lot of the time, if you don't know how to attack debt, that's maybe when you want to really have a discussion with a third party, a financial planner, a professional, a CPA, somebody that you feel like is the, has a value and knowledgeable opinion about how to tackling issues like that. And then you don't have the pointy fingers at one another um, that, you know, what should I do with this and how does that impact me? Um, Amy, I sound like you wanted to ask yeah. something. Oh, well, I was just going to add, um, you know, with all these people getting divorced because they're fighting over their finances and then people are getting remarried, there's a lot of people coming into these, you know, second marriages, obviously, with a lot of prior commitment due to their first marriage. Okay. Um, so I guess, do you have any thoughts on that? Because that's, you know, that's more than a credit card debt, more than a student loan because it's, you know, in California, it's never going to go away, kind of thing. Uh, well, first, I think, first of all, you need to understand that um, with credit card and debt and prior obligation like alimony, child support, there's nothing that you can do to make those disappear. It's something that has been part of your spouse or significant other life, and you just need to either accept it or not. And when you do accept it, this again brings back to being open and opening up the cards um, and Vic, you mentioned to me about you kind of trying to, uh, you said save the relationship. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, uh, understanding, understanding those things is just how are you going to tackle this and how that will impact your overall relationship. And that is a key. Again, why a budget 
is is like a blueprint it is fundamental it's the starting point of anything that you want to do together in moving forward is having that understanding you know what to expect and it doesn't come as a shocker to you that that person have to pay x amount of dollars every month to his his or hers you know ex-husband or wife do you understand or yeah. or the debt yeah. or the debt for example that we carry uh forward mm-hmm. okay yeah no it makes sense it makes sense and and the same thing that again as i mentioned uh, i know we talked about um we talked a little bit about setting limits and i know we talked a little bit about the debt and and understanding that how does that impact our our relationship together? But I think it's also important to have, if you have kids already, and that is designed more for the couples that are married and have kids, you have to understand that now you're adding an additional factor to the equation. Because now you have my needs, your needs, and the needs of the child. And we have to make sure that we are on the same playing field when it comes to understanding what is that that we want to do for our child. It is extremely important to understand that if you think that from early stages of the child development, you think that the percentage of everything that you earn has to go into an investment account for the child future college account, it is important that your spouse thinks the same way and agrees because he or she might think like, no, I want to spend the extra remaining money to spoil my kid and take him to have a, you know life experiences, whether it's Disneyland or traveling and taking him somewhere to see the world. So that's again, making sure that you're on the same playing field. So now you, it's not only you, my expectation, your expectation, but we also have understanding of what is we need to do right on, on, uh, on behalf of the child or for the better of the child. Amy, does any, do you guys have kids yeah. uh, or your future? My fiance has two kids. Okay. Yeah. So. I think we're on the same page. I mean, you're right. It just, it adds, you know, it just adds a lot of cost. And so, you know, it's, it's taking someone that was never married to someone that was married with two kids. So, you know, you're right. There's just a major disparity in how our outgo looks. And, you know, there has to just be understanding of that. Absolutely. And that's what I'm realizing. Well, I want to really uh, conclude kind of like, some of of the tips and advice that I've given you and uh, with the last kind of piece of thought and I want to wrap it up and uh, leave it to you to have some kind of Q&A if you have any questions uh, I will be happy to answer is that many times many times it is extremely hard for us to stay neutral because we are emotional human beings and money being the leading cause of trigger of emotion there's nothing more emotional, perhaps, uh, beyond uh, you know, fear or phobia than money. Money is, is really a trigger to emotion. That's where so many people react very different. That's why the stock market behavior is about emotion, anticipation. What is that that we feel is going to happen? Which leads me to the point of maybe sometimes it's best to seek the, the opinion, the environment, of a third party, of a professional, um, and I'm by all means are not insinu- insinuating myself or my firm, but it's people that you feel comfortable with, people that you feel that you enjoy their company and you feel like you can trust them and you feel that they have your best interest first, where you can have the ability to sit down and share your concerns, share your current financial situation and uh and many times you can avoid being the one to say you see i think we should do this or i think here's the problem that i foresee in your financial situation and in turn leave that to the professional to point out maybe the obvious to you or something that is not obvious to your significant other because then he or she if they're you know experienced a little bit like i've dealt with so many couples and I see that again and again and again, it's sometimes easier for the spouses. And I got a lot of messages and emails and calls saying, you know what, thank you so much for bringing this to the attention of my spouse. I've been trying to mention that to him, to he or she, uh, but uh, they never, never seem to take it serious or never paid attention. And uh, with you, things has changed. You know, they truly understand. 
because a lot of the times we are we are closed to the feedback of our closest people, but we are more susceptible to a a professional and b just somebody else, somebody outside of our circle, and where we feel more open to get feedback, where we feel more open to be vulnerable, um, and uh, because we feel like we're not gonna get judged by the other person. And that is why it's so hard, I told you initially, that when you do those discussions, when you do those topics, it has to be in a neutral place. Uh, and I'm not talking being in, in, a, in an office, like in my office where I meet with couples, uh, it can be just like somewhere outside of whether yours or, or his home, or if you live together outside of your home. It can be in a restaurant, it can be in a, in a small one day, you know, a day trip where you sit in nature and you discuss this topic when a little bit more calm and uh, in, uh, in non, non-hostile environment. Um, that's it guys, that's all I have for you today. I think it's it's been a great discussion. I love the participation. I love some of the things that you got the opportunity to share with me. And I hope that you really enjoy this. I hope that you got uh, taken something out of this that you can share with other people, with your spouse, some action plans that you can feel that you can implement immediately. Um, I will open the floor to some questions that you might have. Feel free to shoot at any direction. Uh, I will try to answer my best, uh, to the best of my ability. And uh, if you cannot think about the question right now, but sometime later while you're driving or, uh, you know, at work or in the shower and you all of a sudden the question pops up, um, you can always feel free to uh, email me or write in a, uh, you know, a private message on, uh, on the meetup group where I can answer by all means. And if you want to meet face-to-face, I am in LA, so uh, I'm happy always to meet uh, people face-to-face, so more than happy to, uh, to get together with you guys as well. So I will open the floor. Amy, Vic, please uh, ask me any questions that you might have. Well, what's your background? Sorry? What's your background? Finances or what? So I, uh, you mean like my educational background? Yeah, yeah. So I have both a master's and undergraduate in finance and uh, obviously been working in the financial industry for the past seven years. Um, and uh, two years ago I've opened, uh, that's when I launched Apex Capital Group and after working for uh, some of the big powerhouses and understanding that I could I want to serve service my clients and other people in a more specific way, and uh, that's where it led us to today. So you are married, right? If I'm married, I'm in relationship. I'm not married. I've I've been I've been married. I've been married. So that's why also this topic is so close to home because I wish now what I known. Uh, I, I wish that I have known what I know now back in the day and I could implement it. But, you know, as they say, yeah, you don't cry over a spilled milk. You learn, you, you live and learn. So you work only with couples or what are your average clients? Um, well, I work, uh, really, I have a variety of clients. I have clients who are individuals, I have clients who are married couples, I have business owners, a whole array. But generally speaking, I specialize in a specific uh, niche markets. Um, a lot of the time I work with, uh, you know, professionals, many times with higher degrees, because uh, they have massive student debt, federal student debt, and uh, that in turn kind of sips into the relationship and prevents couples from really getting kick-started on their financial journey together. So I help them on that, making sure to eliminate federal student debt in the most efficient way possible, and then in turn uh, freeing some money that can help them on the most important financial goals. And of course, I'm working with individuals that uh, whether they are business owners or just general individuals who want to plan for specific financial goals, and I help them with that. Amy? Yeah, so would, is there any books that you recommend that would be helpful to maybe have someone read that, you know, is struggling with this topic or the importance of budgeting that's not just totally, totally dry, but you know, um, help 
you know, it's extremely hard because a lot of the times I will admit financial books are cut and dry, boring. Um, I, I find that sometimes I would refer some people to some um, public speakers that I personally enjoy in the realm of finance. Mm -hmm. I know that there is a book written by uh, Jeff Motsky um, and uh, he wrote about the topic also about uh, uh, couple's guide for financial compatibility and it's pretty easy read. He also shares about his story, about his relationship. And uh, if you want, just uh, send me a message. I'll send you uh, the name of the book so you can take a look at it. I think there's an like an e online version, and then you can order from Amazon the print version as well. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, anything okay. else? You know, you were very, very helpful. You really, this really came at a good time for me personally, and yeah, I think you were you brought up a lot of great, great ideas. So. Well, I am I super happy. I'm super happy and hope that you enjoyed this this talk. Again, um, this will be edited and then I will upload it to uh, YouTube and I will send it for people that have not had the opportunity to listen to the conversation. I enjoyed getting to know each and one of you. Um, by all means, if you don't mind, share your thoughts, share your experience. On the meetup so other people can see what you felt what did you took out of it and uh, I will be probably announcing tomorrow the next uh, the next kind of topic of in conversation and I think it will be really uh, revolves around kind of debt management and I think because that is something so big especially in the US where we have uh, a lot of us carry debt and we really don't know how to get rid of it and I think that is going to be a, you know, a great conversation that can help a lot of people. Yeah, no, that's great. <laughs> What's up, Vic? It's all over the world, not only in the U.S., but in Yeah, that is true, too. <laughs> all right, guys. Well, I will let you go. It was a great pleasure. And, uh, again, if you have any questions, send me a message, and I will be in touch with you soon. Okay, great. One last really quick question. Sure. What part of LA are you in? I am in the Hollywood Hills. Okay. Okay. Because I know that you said in a, with uh, you said you are in the Palisades, or you said you're in Marina del Rey. Yeah, like Marina del Rey, but not you know, no problem. I I again I have clients all the way from Orange County to Northern California and from other states. So by all means, not worry. If you if you want to meet face to face, um, it we can definitely do that. Okay, very good. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You can find such a professional in every area in LA, I believe so. Sorry. I mean, it's a rare profession. You you can't find such a professional in every single area of LA. You can or you cannot. You cannot definitely. Well, I think it's not about finding the professional. The, to be honest, there's a lot of professionals. It's about finding the professional that you feel that you are connected with, that you is trustworthy, is knowledgeable, and most importantly, have your best interest at heart. I cannot tell you how many times I've received clients who came to me and said that they had horror stories with other financial advisors because that advisor did not have their best interest at heart. And that is a key. And I think that is something that you need to get started with, is you need to feel that that person is there for you. Yeah, I mean, this is not a job uh, where, what a regular CPA can do. You know? This is not only about finances, but also about psychology. And I think, I think you're, you're kind of hitting on the nail. A lot of the times, a lot of people telling me, oh, when I have a discussion, this, I work with a CPA. But it's important to remember, CPAs are kind of like, I call it horse with covered eyes. They only see year to year, you know, every year you come to them, you might have not talked to them throughout the year and you just bring in them papers for them to file your taxes. But what about the plan? You know, what about looking a couple years ahead? What about looking for understanding your relationship, how you evolve, your advisor should evolve with you. And, uh, and that is the key. And Amy, I hope that you... Uh, you feel that way. I hope, Vic, that you feel that way. I hope that you feel that everything that I shared with you comes from the bottom of my heart, from experience, from the couples that I've had the pleasure of working with, 
and I truly hope that you that you took something out of it. Sure, I'm very useful, and well, I'll do my best to be present on next webinar. <laughs> All right, Amy, I hope to see you too. Very great. Thank you so much. Bye, guys. Have a great night.